Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, cult classic lovers. Good evening, national science on screen lovers. And good evening, Enzion fanatics. And welcome to our uh, evening of national science on screen night featuring the black hole. My name is David Schilhammer, executive director of Enzion. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this a very important evening. And one of the most important aspects of it is this. We are in partnership with none other than the most important cultural institution in the country, the Smithsonian Institution. So we are deeply, deeply grateful for their involvement. And I'll talk to a little bit more about them in a moment, but I want you to know that Enzion Science on Screen series is funded by the Sloan Foundation in, in cooperation with the Coolidge Theater. Enzion is one of uh, very few 24 theaters, independent theaters across the country, who receive annual funding from the Sloan Foundation to implement our Science on Screen series, which is proven to be extremely popular with our audience. Just to give you a flavor of what we do this year alone, we showed the Stanford Prison Experiment. Ooh. And then we showed, the, uh, we showed Jane, the documentary on Jane Goodall, which was incredible. Uh, tonight we have our cult classics, uh, cult classics, The Black Hole, and I'm sorry for you cult classic fans, this is not on 35 millimeter due to a, a, a challenge with the distributor, but I know you're going to love it nonetheless. And then we always put one of our science on screen uh, films on our family series, so Dolphin's Tale will take place on our peanut butter matinees later this season. So we are deeply grateful to the Sloan Foundation. And w once a year, they pick a night, March 27, tonight, where they ask the 24 theaters involved in their program to celebrate uh, the, the sciences on the big screen. And so each, each theater gets to pick their own movie, but it's done on a national, way, national basis. So we thank the Sloan Foundation for their amazing and continuous support of NZN Science on Screen initiative. So we are joined here by Dr. Matt Schindel, who is the curator of planetary sciences at the National Air and Space Museum at the Smithsonian Institution. And as soon as I'm done talking, which will be soon, Dr. Schindel will give a 30-minute talk prior to, the, prior to the film about his knowledge of all things sciences and planetary. Um, so we are um, grateful. Dr. Schindel and the Smithsonian, uh, some Smithsonian have an initiative to try and take the, to take the Smithsonian experience outside of Washington, D.C. and into communities across the country. And I'm happy to say that Orlando is one of the beneficiaries of the Smithsonian's well, initiative. And uh, they take this program very, very seriously, and we're honored that they are here. And they have a robust um, committee of volunteers, which is called the Orlando Host Committee, who have helped to make this event possible. So I'd like to ask the following uh, to stand. If you're with the Smithsonian, if you're with the Orlando Host Committee, or if you're wearing a badge as a host of the Smithsonian, please stand and be recognized for your efforts. We are all deeply grateful uh, for your support. The National Air and Space Museum is 41 years old, and it has not substantively changed during those 40 years. And we know that orga arts organizations must move forward or at the risk of being stagnant. And so they are under uh, a tremendous initiative uh, to embark upon a $250 million capital campaign to have a transformative re renovation of the National Air and Space Museum. This project will take seven years to complete, but don't panic, rest assured, it will be open every single day during this process. So if you have plans to go or you want to aspire to go, they'll be doing this in phases so that the museum is always open to visitors as it should be. Uh, this project will completely renovate all 23 galleries that they have uh, at the museum. It will provide a new entrance, a new facade. It will build an outdoor pavilion. And the sexiest part of it all is that they'll get all new mechanical systems at the museum. So after 41 years, we know how important that is. So we salute, uh, we salute them uh, very, very much. So 
Um, Dr. Matt Schindel, uh, I'm going to finally introduce him, he is, a, he is a historian of planetary sciences and Earth, uh, and his main focus is on research and development in those specific areas during the Cold War. I just said that. And so he is an amazing gentleman, and I found that he is uh, not only a um, expert, if you will, in black holes, but he is also a sci-fi fan. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome to the stage the curator of planetary sciences at the National Air and Space Museum, Dr. Matt Schindel. Thank you. Thank you. Can I take that? Uh, uh, yeah. Sorry. So thank you all for coming tonight, and thank you, David. Thank you to the Enzion as well for hosting this and everyone who made this possible. Um, so uh, it's really a treat to come out, to be outside of DC, to bring some of the Smithsonian out to you, to be in front of an enthusiastic audience and to talk about a topic that I really love, which is science fiction, um, and also the topic that I study and also love, which is you know, the science of, of what we do out in space. And I love films like this where the two things really intersect, science fiction and science fact, even though, as we'll get to a little later, there may be some question about how factual this <laughs> film actually is. Um, not that that should put anyone off. I don't think it's too important that science fiction really be, you know, religious about its adherence to um, science fact. Um, and I'll give you an idea of why I feel that way in just a minute. But um, let me ask you, how many of you have been to the National Air and Space Museum? <laughs> All right, quite a lot of people. How many have been to our location out in, uh, in Dulles, our Udvarhazy Center? Wonderful, yeah. Well, if you haven't been, I invite you, please come out. I'll let you in for free, um, <laughs> either location. But uh, come soon if you want to see the museum as it is today, because as David indicated, we're about to embark on a huge process of renovating the entire downtown facility, the downtown building, which includes completely redoing all of the galleries. Um, so a little bit about myself. I am a historian of science, as David said. Um, I studied history of science at UC San Diego, and. Uh, then taught history of science at Harvard University before coming to the Smithsonian. I've been at the Smithsonian for about two and a half years now, and I have to say it's been a really exciting time to be at the Smithsonian because we have been in the midst of trying to dream up, basically what would our dream galleries be and how would we build them? Um, and, and that's just been an incredible process. And it's really, um, you know, we call the process revitalization rather than renovation because it's renovation but with more gusto, I think. That's how I think of it. Um, and, you know, it's, it's really an incredible process, partly because, you know, as a new curator, it requires that I really get to know what we have in the collection and how it could speak to the audiences of today and of generations to come, right? So the people here in the audience who maybe are in their 20s, 30s, if you were there as a kid, maybe eventually you'll be bringing your kids to the museum. How will we make sure that this museum continues to talk to your kids, right? Um, we really want to make sure that it does. Um, and part of that is making sure that we tell the history in a way that is sort of relevant today to today, but also in a way timeless, if that's even possible. Um, that, that it really can be interpreted to mean something to folks who weren't alive during Apollo, right? I'm a curator at the museum, and I wasn't alive during the, the Apollo program, and yet that is one of the signature stories that we tell and that we will continue to tell. Um, so part of this task is very difficult because we don't know yet where we're going to go next, right, or, or why. <laughs> What's gonna take us back to the moon if we go back to the moon and what's gonna send us to Mars if we go to Mars? Um, and how are we gonna do it? All of these are open questions. Um, and so how do we decide how we're gonna speak to the generation that maybe does go to Mars? 
You know, we, we like to tell the, the kids that come to the museum now that they could be the first generation of astronauts to land on, on Mars, to see Mars with their own eyes. And it's true, you know, if we do end up sending people to Mars in 20, 30 years, these kids could be the first kids to set foot on Mars. And we want to be the museum that inspires that journey. Uh, so, but how do we do that? How do we talk about a future that hasn't happened yet? So you probably already have guessed that my answer is um, science fiction, right? We, we look at science fiction and what it says about who we are as a species, as a society, as a world, and you know, try to draw some lessons from that. So why should we take science fiction seriously? Uh, before coming to the museum, as I said, I spent two years as a fellow at Harvard University's uh, Department of History of Science. And I taught courses there to Harvard undergrads. And one of my favorite courses to teach was a history of science fiction course. Um, and I like to talk to my students about science fiction as part of a larger constellation of ideas about science and technology and about the human, human future. All of these ideas floating around in popular culture. And it's by engaging with this constellation of ideas that most people in society actually learn about science and how to think about science and technology, how to imagine what the inside of a laboratory looks like, for example. And I think even practicing scientists, people who are, you know, know science firsthand and have trained to be scientists, even they draw some of their identity from the science fiction that they grew up on as kids and probably continue to engage with as adults. I think science practitioners are some of the biggest consumers of science fiction literature and films uh, that I know. That's totally anecdotal, but um, I think it's true. So, so how do we engage with science fiction in the museum? Well, what I have up on my slide right now is one of our best examples of how we take science fiction seriously. This is the studio model of the Starship Enterprise that was used in the original television series. Uh, we have it on display in our Boeing Milestones of Flight gallery, one of our signature galleries. And if you come in through our main entrance, this artifact actually will be one of the first things that you see as, the, as you come into the museum. And you know, uh, we do, we talk about the future and, and we present a lot of images that are based in fact, based in fiction in the museum, right? We do that through our IMAX theater. We do that through uh, the big murals that we have painted on the walls that were done back at the time that the museum opened that presented man's history and future in space. And we also do that with artifacts like this. Um, so why? Why do we put this on display? Um, part of it is because of the vision that Star Trek represented back in the 1960s. This was a vision of the human future where most of the problems of the 1960s had been solved. Uh, it had a diverse crew on board. It had a technology, uh, replicator technology in particular, that provided pretty much everything to the people of that society. Uh, it had basically solved every want, every need, except for that need or that drive to explore. And that's what Star Trek was all about, was about exploring the universe and trying to seek out new planets, new forms of life, right? And that, I think, is what Roddenberry saw, Gene Roddenberry, the creator of the show, as the future of mankind, or it's what he hoped, I guess you could say, would be the future of mankind. And mankind in that vision had joined something much bigger than themselves. They had joined uh, what Roddenberry called the Federation of Planets, right? A, a, a unified group of peaceful and technology, te technologically advanced societies. Um, so it's quite a vision to dream up, especially since it was dreamt up in the midst of a Cold War and in the midst of massive struggles over civil rights, of you know, uh, poverty, et cetera, all these problems of the 1960s that many of which we're still grappling with. Thank God, not the Cold War. Um, but you know, a lot of these other social problems are still with us. So we take this artifact very seriously. Um, we take it as seriously as 
and treat it with the same care as uh, what we bring to the Mercury capsules or the Gemini capsules, the Apollo spacecraft. We preserve it in much the same way that we preserve those. Now granted, with a plywood spacecraft filled with Christmas tree lights, um, there's different challenges to preserving this than there are to preserving spacecraft that were designed to be launched out into space and then come back through the Earth's atmosphere intact. Right? Those things are a little more robust. In this image from our website, um, screen capture here, you see the team of specialists, including curator Margaret Weidekamp in the blue sweater up there, um, that, that focus just on preserving this model so that it could be reinstalled in uh, our Milestones of Flight gallery two years ago when we redid that gallery. Um, we did it, by the way, for the 40th anniversary. And by the way, the museum and I are pretty much almost exactly the same age. Uh, we were both born in 1976. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of funny to work in an institution that's the same age that you are. But um, this team paid excruciating detail uh, and attention to every little detail of this spacecraft, including small paint bubbles that were on the original model so that after restoration, even though a lot of work had been done to replace the paint, improve the structure, it looked exactly like it looked when it was filmed in the 1960s for the original series. And if you haven't seen it on display, one interesting thing to note is you know, this model was only ever shot from one side. So only one side actually has detail. The other side is, is blank and has wires running throughout it. So, yeah, so just like every actor has a good side, the Enterprise has a good side, too. Um, and by the way, uh, that's not the only science fiction that we care about. We also, I'm sorry about the small picture there, but um, this, this coming month, I don't know if you realize, is the 50th anniversary of 2001, A Space Odyssey. And we are going to be recreating one of the rooms from the film, or one of the sets, which is the hotel room from the end of the movie. I don't know how many folks have seen 2001 and remember that room, but if you come see us next month, you'll be able to walk through that room to give you a little piece of, of uh, you know, what that thing, what that room felt like, what that set was like. We'll get back to 2001 a little bit, but now back to the Enterprise. So why would we put a Starship Enterprise studio model on display in one of our signature galleries, which is filled with planes and spaceships that did fly? Right? Why would we put a fake ship that never actually flew? Um, because it's cool, right? I mean, that's part of the reason. And we can light up the, the nacelles. We put new lights in there. We replace the Christmas lights with something that wouldn't potentially catch on fire. And uh, we can play the theme music, and that makes it even cooler. But really, the reason that we put it there is not just because it's cool, but because in the minds of many people worldwide, it did fly, right? It did explore the universe. It helped to shape their understanding and continues to, to shape our understanding of what was possible in exploring the universe, of what our future could potentially be. Then it, like the film that we're going to watch this evening, fits into a larger story about how, it, how space exploration was imagined and how it was eventually realized. Um, and, and this really began in the 1950s, after World War II, in the early 50s, uh, with collaborations between rocket engineers like Werner von Braun, uh, space popularizers like Willie Ley, and artists like Chesley Bonestell, whose art is on display in our museum as well, uh, in sort of making the future of space exploration visible to the American public and trying to sell space as the next frontier for America. And this series of articles in Collier's was one of the first firing shots in, in that sort of uh, well, that's a bad metaphor. Um, <laughs> it launched, no. Um, so that was kind of the beginning of, of thinking about this, although at the same time, it was sort of something that was in the air. In 1950, you had the first sort of semi-serious um, 
a film about space exploration, Destination Moon. It's kind of a classic. Has anybody seen Destination Moon? Oh, wow, quite a few of you have. More than I would expect. So this was meant to be an argument. I mean, this film is an argument for why man should go to the moon, right? And it's not just because it's the next great frontier, although that argument is made. It's also because we have to beat the Russians to the moon. The argument is very explicit in the movie. Um, and Destination Moon really, it actually fits very well with the Collier series because you see the lunar landscape that is painted there behind the rocket, which is a miniature, of course. Um, just like the movie we watched tonight, the movie was made with a lot of matte painting and miniatures uh, so that they could make the sort of special effects that today would be done on computer. But the, the lunar landscape there is painted, and it's painted by the same artist who painted those covers from the Collier's magazines, Chesley Bonestell. If you come to the museum after uh, renovation or revitalization, what you'll see in our Destination Moon gallery, we named the gallery after the film, actually, um, is the painting there of the lunar landscape as a representation of what we imagined that landscape to be in 1950. So this is a real, even though it's a science fiction film, it's a real part of that history of going to the moon. Jump forward a few years and, you know, a sort of local hero, Walt Disney, was building Tomorrowland in California. You know, in Tomorrowland, uh, just like that film, uh, opened the American imagination to the future, right? It was part of the sort of public popular imagination of what space or what the future could bring. And it had tie-ins, as you can see with the sign, to actual space companies that were working on trying to develop this hardware. Um, and it didn't stand alone either. Disney also was teaming up at around the same time with Werner von Braun and other rocket engineers and artists, uh, teaming them up with his own artists to develop a series of three television programs that sort of explained to Americans how space was the next great frontier, how man would conquer space and eventually go to the moon. And here you see uh, Von Braun there with a concept that he had designed of you know, one of what he thought could be a long-term uh, space station. Very different from the space stations that we ended up building in the 1970s and then later during the shuttle program with the International Space Station. But still, you know, these ideas really uh, form the basis of a lot of what you would eventually see in science fiction movies, right? So it is this interplay between artists, between engineers, between scientists, and between filmmakers that really created a whole imaginary landscape of what space exploration could be. So jumping forward now to 1968, you have 2001 A Space Odyssey, which as I mentioned, is coming up on its 50th anniversary. Um, this was regarded as kind of, I mean, even though Destination Moon was based on real ideas, real engineering, this is the film that's usually credited as being one of the very first of the realistic space dramas. I'm, I'm sure most of you here have seen 2001, right? Yeah, if you're a sci-fi fan, you've seen 2001, right? You can't, you can't escape it. Um, it was one of the first science fiction films to really lean heavily on scientists and technologists as advisors. Um, I recently got the opportunity to talk to uh, a, a fellow historian who has done a lot of work on the history of this film, and he called it really the gold standard, even today, of um, you know, the use of science and technology consultants because of its realism. I mean, Kubrick had in mind a very real film, and he ended up making a film that felt very real. And I think even today, when we imagine ourselves in space, this is part of what we imagine, right? Except without Hal, I hope. So jumping forward to 1979, 
This film that we're watching tonight, Disney's Black Hole, was made 11 years after um, 2001, and yet it kind of feels like it could have come out 10 years before 2001. <laughs> and that's not necessarily a criticism. What I mean is, it seems to draw upon the previous era of um, sort of space drama. In reality, though, it actually is more, in fit, fit, more of a piece with what was going on in the 70s, right? If you think about 1979 and how it's different from 1968, in 1968, Apollo was on the horizon. The very next year, we landed humans on the moon for the first time. In 1979, Apollo was, had been canceled since 1972. It had been canceled prematurely, and NASA's budget was much smaller than it had been during that program, and has remained much smaller than it was during Apollo. So in a way, the future didn't seem quite as certain as it had uh, in 1968 in terms of humans living and working in space. Right? It was a much different future. And it was during this time that cinema sort of turned away from that sort of futurism, at least for a time, and you started to see more in the realm of what you might call space opera. Films like um, Star Wars, which came out a couple of years before Black Hole, right? Where it's no longer a vision of the future, right? Star Wars happened long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away. It's not our future, it's not our past. And in a way, Black Hole is kind of the same, even though it's humans from Earth. It's not really based on any imagined trajectory of how we would get from here where we are now to there, or where we were in 1979 to there. It's a beautiful film. Um, and it involves a lot of miniatures. Uh, the spaceships are all built in miniature and then filmed uh, with forced perspective. It involves incredible practical effects, like uh, this backlit star field, which doesn't resemble um, anything, any star field we know of, but uh, you know, it's still pretty. And an incredible black hole effect that was created by using a clear polyurethane tank with a vortex in it, filled with water, and then with colored paint put inside, and then lit from the bottom and shot from the top. So, Imagine layering all of these things together to create a moving, living piece of film which actors then acted in front of. I mean, it's really incredible what the old matte painters and model builders could do. You see the same thing in Star Wars, which came out, like I said, just a couple years prior to this. So what goes on in this film, right? We've got a, sh a ship that seems stranded out in the middle of nowhere, outside of a black hole, where it's presumably going to be pulled in and destroyed. Um, our small ship, I don't want to give away too much, but our small ship that we follow throughout the story discovers it and thinks that it's dead until it suddenly lights up and seems to have life on it. Um, excuse me. Or is it life, right? There's all of these killer robots inside of the thing. I'm not giving away too much, I hope. Um, and at the center of it all is a mad scientist. It's a great mad scientist story more than anything. And by the way, speaking of mad scientists, this is the 50th anniversary, like I said, of 2001. It's the 200th anniversary of what? Frankenstein. It's the 200th anniversary of Frankenstein. So the sort of original mad scientist. It's a great year for science fiction, let me tell you. Um, so we have our mad scientist who is fixated on this black hole and refuses to return to Earth. We don't know what has happened to the crew of the ship. Five minutes, all right, we're getting there. We have goofy robots, I won't say anything more about them because I want to skip to the last part of the talk since I'm running out of time. Okay, well, they're a little goofy. <laughs> but let's talk about black holes. Um, since that's what you're all here to, to hear, is how, how real are these black holes that we have in the film, or the black hole? Um, so, there is science in this movie. It's not completely wrong. I think Neil deGrasse Tyson, who you may have heard of, you know, he's a well-known guy, he seems to think that this is the worst movie ever made from a science standpoint. 
I think he's not entirely right or wrong. <laughs> there is some science in here, and there's some interesting depictions of who does science, why they do science, what does science look like. Um, and like I said, a continuation of the mad scientist theme from earlier literature and film. Um, you know, but, uh, well, let, let's ask. Let's ask an expert. So I did. I asked an expert. I asked one of our astronomy educators to evaluate some of the statements that are made about black holes in the film. Um, so, well, first let me give you a brief description of what a black hole is, right? Black holes are incredibly dense objects, right? Um, they're not holes. They're actually uh, dense objects in space with um, the event horizon, which is where the whirlpool sort of begins, and then the singularity at the center, which is an incredibly dense and massive uh, point in space that has no volume. So if you can imagine, well, you can't really imagine that. It's beyond human comprehension. This is why black holes, I think, are often treated strangely in movies, because it's so hard to even even imagine what they are. Uh, so they're so massive and they have so much gravity that nothing, not even light, can escape from them, right? We can't see them through telescopes, but what we can see is things that they're pulling in. So they're pulling in photons of light, for example. And in this case, in the image that you see here, which is an artist's depiction based on data, it's pulling in part of a star. It's slowly eating that star that is orbiting around its event horizon. Um, so what creates a black hole? It's when a star dies and collapses. It runs out of the fuel that helps it to sort of um, to stay, if you want to say, inflated against its own gravity. Well, when it runs out of fuel, all the mass that makes up that star just falls down in, towards that one point, towards that singularity. It won't ever happen to our sun, by the way, because our sun is not large enough to become a black hole. Our sun would have to be three times larger than it is to actually have the mass to form a black hole. But um, you know, if our sun did, just for the sake of argument, all of its mass would suddenly fit in the size of the Las Vegas Strip. Right? That's what we're talking about, is something very large suddenly being compressed into a very small space. So let's evaluate these statements really quickly. So one of the statements made in the film is that w black holes will eventually consume the universe. They're an all-destroying force. And this is actually true, although it wasn't known in 1979. They kind of were ahead of their time in making that one up. Um, so the universe, we now know or believe, it will expand forever. And as it does that, galaxies will start to be pulled apart. Planets will be pulled apart from their solar systems. and everything eventually will encounter a black hole and fall into that black hole. So it's, you know, optimistic view of the future of the universe. It'll all be black holes. Um, rips in the fabric of space-time. We don't know. That one could be true, might not be true. We just don't know. And finally, long, dark tunnels to nowhere. Not true, because they're not tunnels at all. They are, like I said, a lot of mass, forced into a spot that has pretty much zero volume. So with that, let me leave you with one image before we start the film. You might not know, but at the middle of every galaxy is a supermassive black hole. It's what holds galaxies together. So if it wasn't for black holes, even though they will eventually eat the whole universe, our galaxy, our solar system probably could not exist. So I'll leave it with that, and we can go on and watch a wonderfully beautiful film. <laughs>